My name is Alan Prost, and I'm going to talk to you about pressure support ventilation. In our classification system, this is known as pressure control, continuous spontaneous ventilation, or pressure support, is it's more common. The concept behind pressure support ventilation is to augment the patient's own inspiratory efforts. If the patient's not breathing, the ventilator will not assist. So, to demonstrate this mode, I have a one ventilator over here pretending to be the patient, triggering the test lung, as I often do with my fingers. This ventilator, the patient ventilator, has just your usual circuit on it, passive humidity, and I'm showing it here with an actual endotracheal tube in place. As the patient breathes in and creates negative intrathoracic or intraalveolar pressures, the ventilator senses that as inspiratory effort and kicks in to create mouth pressures to help decrease the work of breathing of the patient. The amount of mouth pressure created is the pressure support level. So pressure support levels are always above P. That extra pressure at the mouth helps decrease the pressure gradient required for the patient to breathe in, thus decreasing the inspiratory effort of the patient. We can augment the patient's own inspiratory efforts with pressure support. So in describing pressure support, the terminology we would use is that it's patient triggered, so it could be due, in this case due to flow or pressure, so it's patient triggered. It's pressure controlled, so the pressure in the circuit is maintained at our pressure support level, so it's pressure limited and it's flow cycle. Because as the patient's inspiratory effort declines and flow declines in the circuit, or the alveolar pressures and mouth pressures suddenly become very close to equal, the ventilator cycles into exhalation. So the trigger is patient trigger due to flow or pressure. It's pressure limited and flow cycle. That's how we describe pressure support. It's a continuous, spontaneous mode of ventilation. And that's because the patient determines the respiratory rate, the TI, the TE, tidal volumes, all the elements of the minute ventilation of the patient are controlled by the patient. So for this mode to be effective, the patient must be awake, must be responding appropriately to changes in their arterial blood gas values. So if they sense a rise in their CO2, they'll increase their minute ventilation to blow that off. So their brain stem and neurological function, the respiratory muscles, and their basic respiratory drive must be intact. But what can be limited is their muscle strength, or their, their even their if they're feeling weak because of paralytics, this mode can augment even the smallest amount of inspiratory effort by the patient so that they can have an effective alveolar minute ventilation. So this is a very effective mode for those patients we want to have spontaneous like breathing, but we don't want them to do as much work as they would on their own. So let's take a look at the controls and see how they interact with changes in our patient's inspiratory efforts. So the setup I have right now is I've got this ventilator just with no pressure support set. Normally with pressure support, the only controls you set would be the FO2, this ramp, which we'll talk about later on specific to the Avita ventilator, the amount of PEEP and the pressure support level. Right now I have the pressure support level set at zero, so we're just maintaining CPAP, or constant positive airway pressure. With my test lung here, I have the 840 ventilator pretending to be the patient. So this is creating the inspiratory effort to drive the test lung instead of me pulling it up with my fingers. So the test lung itself is being pulled up by that ventilator and creating patient inspiratory effort. If we look at our waveforms here, you've seen this one before. The white line is the alveolar pressures, and the red line is the pressures in the ventilator circuit, or the mouth pressures of our ventilator. So right now it's trying to maintain them. It's not doing a very good job. That indicates to me that it's not very responsive to maintaining a good CPAP level. So now let's see what happens when we increase the pressure support level on our patient. So let's put it up to about 10. So now when the patient triggers 
inspiration by drawing in a little bit of a breath, the ventilator pressurizes to our set 10 centimeters of water pressure. So that pressure is delivered here, right at the mouth, the, right by the patient's endotracheal tube, as I'm showing here. I'm measuring the pressures on the distal end of the endotracheal tube just before they go into the test lung here. So the pressures here are alveolar pressures. If I look at the flow waveform, you can see uh, the flow is on, and then as soon as it declines, it switches into exhalation. And that's one of the critical elements of pressure support, is that decline in inspiratory flow signals the ventilator to go into exhalation. So this mode looks very much like pressure control, except that it's controlled by the patient instead of the ventilator. It's not time triggered, it only ever responds to patient triggering. And that the duration of inspiration is controlled by the patient themselves. We can increase the amount of augmentation that the patient's receiving by increasing the level of pressure support. Increased levels of pressure support usually decrease the patient's work of breathing. They can adjust their work of breathing to get the tidal volumes and the TIs or the inspiratory time that they like and would feel comfortable for them. So in the mode of pressure control, continuous spontaneous ventilation, pressure support, the patient dictates how long inspiration will occur, can be long, can be short, they dictate the tidal volume that they'll take in, and we control with the ventilator the amount of augmentation or the amount of support we're going to give to the patient to decrease their work of breathing. Our classification system indicates how the, the mode responds to patient effort. It's triggered by patient effort. It could be flow or, or pressure. So it's patient trigger. It's pressure control, we set the amount of pressure control, and it's flow cycle. So we have a pressure limit, and then a flow cycle occurring. When inspiratory flow declines to approximately 25% is a normal number that we often see. So when inspiratory flow declines to about 25% of its maximal flow, the ventilator cycles from inspiration to exhalation. And we can have a very long breaths, very short breaths, very small, quick breaths. It's totally determined by the patient's inspiratory efforts. That's the mode of pressure support. This mode is particularly effective for patients who are starting to recover from their initial disease process. They've got, they've got to be have a neuro, intact neurological drive. They have to have some ability to initiate and maintain ventilation on their own, so they need the musculature and the rib cage to be intact. They need to be able to regulate their minute ventilation or their ventilatory requirements to their carbon dioxide or their blood gas needs. If those are intact, we can then dictate or determine the amount of work of breathing for the patient. High levels of pressure support, low work by the patient. Low levels of pressure support, increased work by the patient. Once we get down to pressure support levels about five or six centimeters of water pressure, we think we're just overcoming the work of breathing through the endotracheal tube. That's an indication that maybe they don't need to be on mechanical ventilation at all. When we have pressure support levels of about 12 to 15 centimeters of water pressure, that's considered a moderate amount of pressure support. We're augmenting their inspiratory efforts, but not greatly. The patient has somewhat regained the ability to spontaneously breathe. Pressure support levels of 18 to 20 are very high levels of pressure support, showing that our patient is still probably very ventilator dependent and incapable of large amounts of work of breathing. We've learned the hard way that the only way we can usually determine how much work the patient can tolerate is by doing something called a spontaneous breathing trial. What we do with those often is we put them in the mode of pressure support and then we'll turn the pressure support level down to a moderate level to be five or six centimeters of water pressure, just to help overcome the resistance of breathing through the endotracheal tube.
So that's my description of pressure support, C-incline.